All right, my name is Ross Desmond, and I want to take you through a little story. So a project must be tended by three factors for success. The team that develops the product, the work environment, and the interactions with people from different disciplines all around you. The seemingly casual conversations with those individuals, when guided properly, can give your team the upper edge. During the most important project of my life, I only knew of the first, the team. But little did I know that it was my interactions and just casual conversations with my peers that drove innovation throughout our project. So in August 2012, a team of three undergraduate robotics engineers with a graduate student and professor advisor began a project. And that was to create modular devices for a powered wheelchair to become semi-autonomous. The resulting wheelchair assists those in navigation for those who are mentally or physically incapable of using a regular powered wheelchair. It does this by avoiding stairs, proximity checks, doorway navigation, wall avoidance, and more. In just 90 minutes, we equipped a regular powered wheelchair into this. So for the first team, the first factor was the team. We were passionate about this project as well as meeting our graduation requirements. I mean, obviously. But I can only speak for really for myself. And as for a while, it took a little, a little bit to really get this idea into my head what it actually meant to me. I began to recall family and friends who had lost their mobility over time and as they went through life. And they lost confidence, and you could see it in their eyes. And the one thing about me, the one picture that I always see is seeing my grandfather at a party. And he was in one room, and everyone else had moved to the other, but he couldn't get there. He had lost his mobility actually quite recently. And I realize now that that would have helped me throughout this project. That by having that thought and by thinking about my grandfather actually regaining his mobility, regaining his confidence in life, and being more excited about just being with us, it could have made the difference. And so that drove me personally throughout this project, and I became more productive because of it. So this is the resulting wheelchair. The environment was ideal. We were doing research in a research school inside a robotics laboratory with hundreds of students going in and out 24-7. A plethora of knowledge was going in and out of our lab, just our lab, graduate students, undergraduate students, professors. And we had everyone. So each student and professor had a different background, a different history. So even if we were all the same major, we had plenty to go on. So looking at my team, the environment, and the overall, I guess, factors, I felt, was sure that we were a match, ready to be struck. I was super excited, but I was wrong. We had all the elements. We were missing a key skill. And to really stress the importance of that skill, I need to take you back to the beginning of our project. So back in September of 2012. After a meeting with our advisor, we were ready to go. So we set up a meeting with our team and began a first task that we devised. And that task was, was pretty simple. It was to accurately get the speed and direction of the wheelchair. Not too bad. So when we stumbled on this project, we had done things like this before, and we came up with five viable answers in that quick hour meeting. The tricky part was that our solution had to be adapted to different wheelchairs because people can't really afford to buy a whole solution at once. So within those few hours, we picked an idea. It was a new, innovative idea, and no one had done it before. We were excited. Again, we were seniors. What better did we know? <laughs> at the end of the first month, the only thing we had accomplished was a prototype, some physics behind the actual prototype, and we discovered that we just needed more research, more time. But it had been a month. And this was only supposed to be a seven-month project. We were supposed to have breaks in between you know, terms, I guess. But it was only supposed to be seven months. So after the first month, almost two months, we called for an impromptu meeting and decided maybe we just didn't have enough ideas to pick the right one, the one that was actually worth for our project. So we tasked ourselves. We split up to find as many solutions to this seemingly trivial problem as we could. 
seems viable. So by asking professors, students, and all my friends and really just family, we found a few options. They really just, the only thing I remember is them saying how much they liked my idea. I was like, okay, cool, this makes me feel better. But we were still behind. And so even though I found little that we already knew of, we decided to have the next meeting the next day. And we, we came in and we had two more ideas than we had before. So that time we decided to stay the course. So that night in the lab we were working on this new innovative idea because we're behind, we're rushing. And one of my colleagues comes up to us and asks us, you know, why we were doing this. And I knew that was a bad sign. So we told him what we were trying to accomplish. And he gave us an idea. And that idea was to put a wheel on top of another wheel, like you see down in the bottom. And this way we could measure the rotation of that wheel. Seems pretty simple. And we actually don't need to know how fast the, the big one is going, or how the size of it that is, because we can already tell. Just take my word for that for now. And so my partner and I looked at each other and we laughed. You know, it wouldn't be as easy as one, two, three. There's actually pretty complicated parts in there. But it could work. <laughs> so that time I, I sat to myself and said, well, what, why didn't we have that idea to begin with? People use this in FIRST Robotics. My friends have been in FIRST Robotics. They've even used this. Why did it not come up? In a place, a robotics lab full of hundreds of students, why did I not get this seemingly trivial idea? So I sat back and analyzed my conversations with my peers. Maybe it was just that I talked too much. I'm pretty good at that. Or that I was just too excited about my idea, and I didn't remember any others. I was just too focused, too excited. But then I realized I was doing something even worse. I was stifling their creativity. So let's try something. We're having a conversation, you and I, and I ask, what kind of book would you recommend? I really like Harry Potter. Man, J.K. Rowling, phenomenal. And I also really enjoy some movies like Sherlock Holmes. Within that 30 seconds, looking at the situation, I went from an unbounded question, which was, you know, what book should I read next? to this tiny little spot in memory. So by, going, by doing this, I was actually not letting your brain expand on all possible solutions. And I instantly delved down a path that maybe you didn't know of and make you uncomfortable. So if I just left out some of those details, just ask the original question, would you have come up with more ideas if I had waited and then added a detail of those or two? Would you have come up with something different? Remember, this is just a quick, casual conversation. So in this case, the book is the same as our motion tracking problem. We found the beginning of an idea that will be used in our final project because a particular student asked the right question. They asked the broader topic. So just as I was stifling someone's creativity, I figured I could carry a conversation that would promote it instead. So I looked a little towards psychology as an engineer. I like to study, so I read books. But I looked mostly towards my successes and failures with the conversations that I had had. So I devised a plan. It wasn't an evil plan. It was a good, I felt it was a good plan in order to get better information from people during a casual conversation. So the first step when approaching someone is to get an idea of what their background is, what they studied before, what their history is. And then generalize your problem to be that more relatable to their discipline. Seems simple. So if I approach a computer scientist and say, well, I have a rolling chassis that's going at a certain velocity, and I want to know how fast it's going. Well, that doesn't make anything click up there. It's not allowing me to relate that problem to them. So instead, for the computer scientist, I would say, well, I have an object, and I just want to track where it is. And I actually got a really good answer. Why not a mouse? Pretty simple. Mouse tracks both speed and direction. So if I went to the mechanical person and gave the rolling chassis, then they probably would have come up with something more relatable. And so by doing this, I'm helping to stimulate their creativity. But not only that, give them something relatable so they don't feel completely lost during a conversation. So the next step, let's take a step back. You might have led the conversation, but keep in mind, that you want them to expand on it. Relax and just stop talking. So just keep in mind every idea they give. 
and let them expand on it. You're going to have plenty of time to analyze this later. So as they ask questions, answer with small details. Let them work through it. Let them make your job easier. And it's only a quick conversation. So once they've slowed down on ideas, then ask how they would proceed with that big problem. So ours was trying to get the distance and velocity of the wheelchair. So once they give me an idea, I'd say, well, I need to put it on different wheelchairs. How would I do that? So by giving them a small idea later on, this way they have already picked the idea that they like the most, and they can do the work for you. So after you gather all of these ideas, you use them in your decision-making process. And the last part is to always remember that this is a two-sided conversation, not a business meeting. Spend only three to five minutes on your topic, if it's just casual, and set up a meeting later if they're really excited about it. However, those three to five minutes are crucial. Not only that, the 30 seconds in which I had given an opening talk was extremely crucial as well. So by doing this technique, you can be sure that you are actually using the diversity around you to gather ideas. So that's actually the final design of our wheel on wheel encoder. So he'd given us a simple idea. And what we did was we had used this technique and gone up to different types of engineers and put it in their own kind of perspective. And each of these parts, even though that was the main idea, we had just broken it up, gotten more and more in depth with making a larger problem. So while we had all the elements to a successful project, we were missing this key skill. And we couldn't actually use the diversity around us. So a good way to think of it is like, I entered a library and I don't know how to read yet. I had plenty of resources around me, but I couldn't actually access them. So after learning this early on, we gathered enough ideas to choose the right ones for our project. And we came up with all of that before. And we created six multi-prototyped physical products that when used on a power wheelchair, help it navigate inside reliably. It was exciting. Three people in seven months created the artificial intelligence, the software that would be used to get it to drive and use something called a behavior-based approach. We were able to do not only the mechanical solutions, the electrical solutions, the computer science solutions with just three of us. I was extremely happy. So, but where we got those ideas, we would never have been here. If we had continued on the original path, we might still be on that one today. We would never have been here. So therefore, I believe a carefully guided conversation is the key to gathering the ideas from the diversity around us. Thank you very much.